the Old Time Gospel Hour, Program 527, Regular Ready version. to take me. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the Faith Partners and Friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating 25 years of Christian ministry. You may be seated. I'm speaking today from Proverbs chapter 22. As you know, we are teaching and preaching through the 31 chapters of the Proverbs. The biblical theme is living successfully. And the key word is wisdom, defined as seeing things from God's point of view. Today, from, Psalm, uh, from Proverbs 22, I'm speaking on the subject, building credibility. And we're speaking from three perspectives here, building credibility in your personal relationships, in your business relationships, and in your moral relationships. So have your Bible open. And those who are watching by television, we would challenge you to get your Bible open to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22. We have, for the last few weeks, I would say eight or nine weeks, uh, been urging our friends across several nations uh, to call us on our toll-free number, enlist in the scholarship club, our 15,000 club, and as soon as you do that, and that toll-free number is on the screen and will be th periodically throughout the program, when you call that toll-free number, joining the 15,000 Club and providing a partial scholarship for one of the more than 5,000 students here in the Liberty Baptist Schools, we're going to send you a set of books that we really believe are the finest books to enhance one's Bible study habits that are in print today. We call those four books the Christian Family Library. And we've done all we can to get every Christian family watch his Old Time Gospel Hour, to call us and join the 15,000 Club and receive an appreciation for your investment in one of our students, the Christian Family Library. The first of these four books is the Super Giant Print Bible. There's nothing like it for those who have problem reading the small print of the average Bible, 24-point type, almost block letters. And uh, that has been, we've heard so many comments from friends everywhere who said that one was just for me. And I'm reading the Bible again. I can see it. I can see the words. And uh, we, we, we believe that's going to be greatly uh, useful in helping many who have given up reading Bible print. And we'd like for you to have that one. That's the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. The second is a children's Bible, the Illustrated Bible for Children. It's a picture Bible. And in that Bible, our dean, Dr. Towns, dean of our seminary, and others have written 184 Bible stories in words that children, your children and grandchildren, love and understand. 300 pictures accompany those stories to make the stories come alive. In addition, we have a third and fourth book in that set, the Liberty Bible Commentary on the Old Testament, and book four, the New Testament, in the which the Bible professors here at Liberty, under the leadership of Dr. Heinsohn and Dr. Dobson, have actually taken all 66 books of the Bible, all 1,189 chapters, and in the left column of each page, given us the King James text, and right adjacent in the right column, the, the meaning, the commentary on that verse. And as far as I know, there's nothing like that in print. So those four books, the Christian Family Library, we want you to have. We would like, if you haven't yet joined the 15,000 Club, that you'll dial us on the toll-free number and later, We'll tell you more about it, but uh, we want you not only to help our young people get a Christian education here, but we would like for you to have the Christian Family Library in your home for your Bible 
study and your family devotions. Right now, the Old Time Gospel Hour Choir, led by Mr. David Randlett. David Randlett and this choir and about 300 singers want me to in invite all of you to the Living Christmas Tree. This is early, but write the dates down. December 10, 11, and 12, the Living Christmas Tree, a Virginia spectacular held every year on this platform. Everything is taken out. A tree reaches right to the ceiling, and our singers are right up in that mammoth tree and around it singing the story of God's love come down to man. It's a Virginia spectacular. We have five performances. We can pack 4,000 persons in for each performance, and usually many do not get in. There will be two performances on Friday, uh, the 10th of December. That's Friday afternoon at what time? Friday evening, Saturday afternoon. Okay, Friday evening at what time? At 7.30. 7.30, Saturday? At 2 o'clock. 2 p.m. and? And then on Saturday evening, 7.30. 7.30? And Sunday, the matinee as well. two o'clock, and, and our regular evening service at six. all right, and then early on Sunday evening at six p.m. So that's the times, and we urge you to attend. We also want to remind all of our friends of Baptist Fundamentalism '84. 
We're going to have a tremendous conference in Washington, D.C., April 11, 12, and 13, 1984, in the beautiful new Washington Convention Center, not yet completed, 26,000 seats. You must pre-register. Uh, we will have two sermons on Wednesday night, uh, April 11, and then from 9 a.m. till 10 p.m. on Thursday and Friday, uh, we'll have some 28 uh, pastors preaching the Word of God, a 4,000-voice choir, and many special musical groups from the various uh, Christian schools participating. Uh, we've asked President Reagan to bring the final address on Friday night. It's going to be three unforgettable days and nights in the nation's capital, and if you will call us on the toll-free number and ask for the brochure on the Washington Convention, we'll send it to you. We blocked out 10,000 hotel rooms in the D.C. area. We'll send you that list of hotel rooms so that you can make your reservations as well. We're happy to have with us from many different countries, I think 11 countries, the World Press Institute. Would you stand? We're glad to have you with us. All of you are sitting together, I believe, and the World Press Institute. I don't know if we will be in your country with this program or not, but we are in Austra Australia. Who's from Australia? Right here. We are on there. And uh, other parts of the nation uh, of America and Canada and uh, the Philippines, etc. So glad to have you. Let's give them a hand of welcome, shall we? Thank you. The battle for religious liberty is really the battle that brought America into being. And for these several hundred years, from the days of the first colonists to this present hour, religious liberty, religious freedom has been basic to us. We enjoy the privilege of coming together in a place like this without any fear of gendarmes, soldiers, military uh, people to prohibit us from worshiping God as we please. Uh, that's a great privilege. I was reading this week of what is happening in Romania and the hardship that's being imposed upon many of our preachers right now in Romania because of their attempt to worship and serve the Lord. And behind the Iron Curtain, in many parts of the, of the Soviet-controlled world, uh, religious freedom is purely window dressing, virtually non-existent. We must always be confident that that cannot happen here, and the only way that can be prevented is for us to be very alert to every vestige of intimidation against religious liberty. I was in Nebraska some time ago, and uh, I was in Louisville, Nebraska, a very small area where a little church, uh, Faith Baptist Church, I believe is the name of it, exists, a little church with about 100 members, they have a Christian school of 30 students in that student body. In that same state, there, there was an Amish community. They have since packed up, sold out, and gone back to Ohio because of the lack of religious liberty in that state. But uh, the Pentecostals and the Catholics and so forth and so on, the Baptists, uh, they have their schools there, non-public schools, accept no funds from the government. And the parents and the pastors wish to educate their children as they see fit, without intimidation or controls from the state government. Forty-two states in America no longer require licensure or control for a Christian school, for example, to operate. Nebraska is not one of them yet. And uh, I was watching some films the other day where Pastor Everett Sullivan was standing in his pulpit in the little Faith Baptist Church and uh, the 30 children of his Christian day school were seated there, and some pastors who were visiting uh, his church were in that auditorium. And the uh, educational people there in Nebraska had brought charges against the pastor and the school and the parents, the, the church, for operating a Christian school without licensure from the State Board of Education. And the sheriff, actually, I saw the film on the news clip, actually came into the building looking for the pastor actually came to the pulpit uh, upon finding the pastor, placed him under arrest in front of the little children. His crime now, operating a Christian school. The children seeing it all happen. He was taken down the center aisle under arrest. The children, you could hear them crying. Not in Russia, in Nebraska, the United States of America. And that pastor was taken to jail. 
and uh, spent many days and nights in that jail for that crime. The question I'm asking is, does religious liberty mean anything to us out here? That's not our church. We have no controls over that church. But I, I tell you that whether it's Roman Catholic or Jewish or Baptist or whatever, religious liberty is either for all of us or none of us. There can be no difference. And uh, we need to pray for Pastor Sullivan and pray for the leaders there in Nebraska in government that they will do what 42 other states have done in this country, and that is allow absolute religious liberty uh, for any parents and pastors to operate their own schools as long as they meet the academic standards and health, fire, hygiene, all those kinds of things, that curriculum, certification of teachers, licensure of the schools should not be a requirement because after all, children belong to parents, not to the state. And I hope you will pray about that. That's one reason why we're engaged in the effort that President Reagan has put forth, the constitutional amendment to return voluntary prayer to the public schools. Not mandated, not pre-written, we're against that, but voluntary prayer to public schools. And I'm doing my best to, to alert the people of this country to what it's all about. And we would like to have your vote on the issue. If you haven't voted yet, I wish you would call us on our toll-free number, 1-800-446-5000, and simply say whether you are for or against the return of volunteer prayer to our schools. <clears throat> to our schools. Madeleine O'Hare, Ed Shemp, and others were participated in a court ruling some 20 years ago that effectively eliminated prayer from the school system of this country. This little package is being sent to everybody who calls and votes regarding prayer in schools. And inside this package, we have two bumper stickers that we, you're seeing them all over the country now. And the bumper sticker simply says, kids need to pray. And the school books and the apple on top tell the whole story uh, that children should have the right to pray in public schools. We'll send you two of them for your vehicles. And my booklet entitled, How to Get Your Prayers Answered, a booklet to help you in your personal prayer life. So if you'll dial us on the toll-free number, we'll send all of that to you today. And most importantly, uh, we, you'll be helping us as you cast your vote to make our voice heard with the people who can make the difference and who can get prayer back in the schools of this country. I agree with the president. I've never met anyone who was injured by exposure to a voluntary prayer. And I've met a lot of people, I think millions of them, who were very much hurt by the elimination of the very existence of God and, the, and uh, the privilege of prayer from our public school systems and other public places. So it's time to change that. Call us, cast your vote, and we're waiting by the phones to take your call. You know, I, I remember back as our quartet comes, I remember back years ago when I was first converted to Christ, uh, visiting out in little country churches. We, I was a student at Baptist Bible College, Springfield, Missouri, and as a part of our Christian service, we would get sent out uh, to lead singing for or to help in the Sunday school with little country churches for the practice and the, and the experience we got and for the ministry that those little churches required that either had circuit pastors who came maybe to seven churches and ministered to all of them or churches that had no pastor. Some of you, as I look around this building, uh, who have gray hair and some with none, are quite old enough to remember the old country church. And I've asked these four young men to sing for us a song that'll bring back some thoughts and memories of the old country church. Shouted down the aisle at that old, at that old country 
Quartet, the old country church. That brings back a lot of memories. And we're training the students here at Liberty Baptist College and Schools, thousands of them, in the old time gospel, the old time faith, belief in the Bible. We are fully accredited and we are academically excellent, but more than that, we're training young champions for Christ. Two weeks ago, I took you up on Liberty Mountain, took you for a helicopter ride, showed you the campus, all 4,000 acres, introduced students to you, had them give their testimonies. And then I ask you to help me make the difference in their lives through teaching them and training them as we do at Liberty. I ask you to call me on that toll-free number that's on your screen right now. And I'm asking you to do it right now. I want you to call me. I want you to join our scholarship club. We call it the 15,000 Club. I want you to pledge $200, which you can give all at once, or $20 a month for the next 10 months. That's up to you. But I want you to call and pledge that $200. An LBC student or one of our staff members will answer. Make your pledge, join the 15,000 Club, and help me by providing a partial scholarship for one of our students. Your gift will go into the general fund, the construction fund here on this campus, money that usually comes from what the students pay for tuition, room, and board. We call it a scholarship fund, enabling us to keep tuition costs down where our students can afford to attend here. We accept no government funds. The only help we get is from people like you who believe in us. Now, when you call me today, the first thing I'll do is mail you this a particular form right here, signed by me with your name on it, not John Samples, but yours, hanging on your wall. It says to everyone who comes by, you are providing a partial scholarship to help a student through college at Liberty. Secondly, and I showed you the, these four books earlier today, we will send you these four books right here, the Christian Family Library. Here they are. Four books that ought to be on your library shelf. A little earlier, I showed you those four books, and I told you why we call them the Christian Family Library. For example, book number one is the super giant print Bible. This particular book right here has 24-point type. It's block letters, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs. I want you to have that book, and if you have a sight problem reading the Word of God, that book is worth all the effort alone. Book two is a children's Bible. It's the illustrated Bible for children. It's a picture Bible, and inside you'll find 300 pictures and the words 
uh, that little children understand, make the Bible come alive for them. Uh, book three and book four, the Liberty Bible Commentary. This is the Old Testament, all 39 books, and the New Testament. And by the way, uh, both of those books have, for example, the King James text right here in the left column, and then right across the column, the meaning that our Liberty Bible professors have given you, the commentary on what the verse means. Invaluable for Bible study. You can't get those books anywhere else. Now, just as two weeks ago, I begged you in our special program entitled The Difference to call me and join the club and provide a $200 scholarship. I'm doing it again now. And I will, by UPS, ship those four books out to you today. We will type your name and address on a label, affix that label to a package, and that package by UPS will be delivered to your door very likely in the next three to five days. When you hear me next Sunday, and by the way, this is Thanksgiving time, we're approaching Christmas, uh, you'll have those books. You may want to use them for a Christmas gift. We have taken four of those books, one set of the Christian Family Library, and Christmas wrapped them just to get your attention. For that person who has everything, why don't you, if you don't need those four books, join the 15,000 Club. Pledge $200. We'll send you the books. We won't Christmas wrap them. We'll send them to you. And then you can wrap them in the package that this is right here and give them to that friend who has everything, something they will cherish for the rest of their lives. And because they're so beautifully and permanently bound, they will no doubt pass them on to their children. What a way to do your Christmas shopping. But more important than that, it will be a Christmas gift for a student here at Liberty. When you pledge that $200, I'll write you a letter with a self-addressed envelope inside in the which you can send back your tax-deductible $200 scholarship gift, or you can give it $20 a month for the next 10 months, however you want to do it. But as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, here on this third weekend in November, our students are here. We're concluding a semester, over 5,000 students from all 50 states and many foreign countries, and I've got to get them underwritten. So please call me. Let me send you the books, but more importantly, Invest in one of our young champions for Christ. I am looking for your call. I hope you'll call me. I hope that this will be a Thanksgiving gift for one of our students. If you live in Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, you can't call. Write me to make your pledge. But whether calling or writing, I'll ask you to do it right now. Our message today is from Proverbs chapter 22. And before I bring that message, the sounds of liberty from Liberty Baptist College are singing about that victory, that triumph that is in Christ. And before they sing that, Jenny McCoy, hold your left hand up, would you, about in that angle. And Bruce, would you put a camera right on it to see what some little boy did to her Friday night? But he can't marry you till you graduate, unless he leaves you here. Is that a deal? Mm, okay. Here they are, the sounds of liberty. See 
Thank you, Sounds of Liberty. And just before my message from Proverbs chapter 22, I'm 49 years old, and if the Lord allows me to live my three score and 10, my 70 years, I'm more than two thirds through my lifespan. What I do, I must do now. The real burden on my heart would be those precious young people up there on Liberty Mountain, over 5,000 of them. That's why we are pushing the 15,000 club and trying to get them educated. But I must now look to the day when I'm no longer on the scene, the Lord's called me out, or I'm no longer physically to raise the money to build that great university for Christ. That means we need an endowment. Many of the great universities have hundreds of millions of dollars in endowments. We have virtually none. A lot of that is because we haven't spent emphasis on that. Let me share with you something that many people are doing for Liberty Baptist College now that's very helpful and perhaps you would prayerfully consider. I want to have this school underwritten for the years to come, so that when I go home to be with God, the work that God raised up here will continue. We have what we call the give it twice concept. Here in the United States, seven out of 10 persons die without a will. And of those who prepare a will, 80% of them do not draw it in such a way that the maximum benefit is set aside for their children, their heirs, and for the Lord's work. I believe there are enough Christian people who, if each of you had a will and were a good steward in death as well as in life and would allow us to show you how to give it twice. That is, because of the tax laws in this country, one of our field men, and we have 21 of them out there who can come to your home by your invitation and help you with no obligation to do it. You can put your house in order. You can actually give more to your children, the total value of your present estate, if the Lord called you home today, and likewise give that much again to the Lord's work, namely Liberty Baptist College, your children get more than they would have gotten, you avoid unnecessary taxes, and you give the Lord's work your total estate. You invest at Liberty Baptist College in young people. We call it the give it twice concept. Most people don't know about it, don't avail, avail themselves of it. And if you will write to me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, and say, Jerry, I'd like to know about the give it twice concept. I'd like to take care of my family with my total estate. I'd like to give that much again to Liberty Baptist College. I'd like to do it before I go home to be with the Lord. I'd like to draw it up now with no obligation, no charge, no cost. One of our field men at your invitation will come and make an appointment at your home confidentially and privately to help you. Write to him and say, Jerry, I want to know about the give it twice concept. We need your help. And I think if you'll do that, if you'll just write me and mark it personal on the envelope, you'll be glad you did. 
Proverbs chapter 22, beginning reading from verse 1, page 997 in your Faith Partner Study Bible. Solomon said, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward or rebellious. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. The slothful man saith, There is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. The mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee? Rob not the poor, because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause, and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, and get a snare to thy soul. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean or average men. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that every day as we open the pages of this book, we hear from heaven and we get instructions for successful living. Help us today to hear something that will help each of us to be better equipped to serve you and to represent Jesus Christ before a world that is hurting and in need. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled the message today from Psalm, uh, Proverbs 22, Building Credibility. Building Credibility. All of life involving the development of character should be aimed at this goal, building credibility. If people cannot believe in you, it really doesn't matter how well you say something. If people cannot believe in you, if your word is worthless, if your character is flawed, it really doesn't matter how much you accomplish or accumulate in life. And thank God for those persons who have lived and died and left behind a heritage, character, integrity, love, compassion, decency. And today I would say that as we're talking about living successfully in the 31 chapters of the Proverbs, nothing is more important than building credibility before our fellow men. Of course, our credibility with God is the most important issue, but it's also important that we have a horizontal relationship that makes the value of our ministry and life and contribution worthwhile. The very first verse begins with three words, a good name. That's where the word credibility comes from, a good name. And in these first few verses, we began talking about the acquiring of a good name, building credibility first by your personal relationships. Your personal relationships. Number one, we must get our priorities right. 
And in verse 1, we are told that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. In a materialistic society where one is committed to getting all he can and canning all he gets, it is important to understand what we read in the New Testament, that a man's life consisteth not of the things which he possesses. And as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that we came into this world naked, and it is certainly we will care, carry nothing out, that we are to place a, a, the proper priorities on things. And I was reading to you this past week from 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul said that we came into the world absolutely naked, void of anything, and we will go out the same way. And so the only important thing in life is between birth and death to develop the proper priorities. And the first priority is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you should make that priority number one. Right behind your relationship with God Almighty uh, should be your relationship with your family. I feel that my first obligation is to the little girl who plays the piano at this church and has for 26 years, my wife, Maisel. Uh, I have an obligation to our three children, Jerry, Jeannie, and Jonathan, that supersedes my responsibility to you. I'm glad to be your pastor, but my ministry is third behind my commitment to God and my family. And I hope that every father and every mother in this building feels that way. Dr. Narimore said, For what shall it profit a man if he save the whole world and lose his own children? And we'll come to that in just a few moments. Uh, we have an obligation to God first, to our family second, and then to our work, our ministry, our vocation third. The second word under developing personal relationships and building credibility thereby is the word philosophy. Verse 2, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all, meaning that as far as God is concerned, the rich and the poor are all merged and put in the same pot. And God doesn't see you by what you have or don't have. God sees you for what you really are. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. When you read of the Howard Hughes and the thousands like him who live and accumulate great wealth and die in loneliness and hurt and despair, it ought to be all the sermon any of us needs to hear that that is not what life is all about. I don't know anything about the personal lives of any of those people that I might have mentioned, but I can tell you that you can have multi-millions of dollars and die miserable and live miserable, as a matter of fact, a miserable life and die miserably. Or at the same time, you can be very poor and live miserably. Or you can be wealthy and live a very happy and fulfilled life, and you can be poor and live a happy and ful a fulfilled life. Things do not constitute life. What is your philosophy? God is not against you having things as long as things don't have you. If God can put things in your hands and allow you to be the steward, the foreman, the straw boss, who uses those things by orders from heaven, direct orders from heaven, then God is not against trusting you with things. But most of us are not very trustworthy. And when someone said God must really love the poor, he made so many of them. There's so many, so many of us that if we had what the Howard Hughes has had, it would do the same thing to us. And God knows our hearts and He knows what we're capable of managing. And He puts in our hands only what we're capable of managing. But the philosophy is that God is no respecter of persons, that God loves all people alike. That best, had best be your philosophy. You know, I, the thing I love about Thomas Road Church, on any given week, any week, Dr. Heinz and I was sitting here Wednesday night discussing that during the song service. Shouldn't have been doing that, but we were discussing that, that... Uh, that on any given week, 20,000 different people worship with us at Thomas Road Church. 20,000 different people, Sunday morning, Sunday night, five services, 1,000 Sunday school teachers and workers, a Wednesday night service, over 20,000 different people. Some of them come in here without shoes. We have to buy shoes for the little children to pick them up to bring them to the house of God. And then the third word is the word planning. Because in Verse 3, a prudent man, a wise man, foreseeth the evil. He looks down the road. He sees the consequences of his decisions and actions. And 
hides himself. That is, he avoids those unnecessary problems. But the simple, that is, those who are not availing themselves of the facts, pass on, rush on, and pay the price. They're punished. Now, we must be planning in our lives if we're going to be successful. Success in life doesn't just happen. You plan for it. You decide the principles that are important in your life. You decide your priorities. You get your relationship with God and man right. And then you learn how to work with your hands and do the things that are necessary. You learn, uh, you learn where to go and where not to go, what to do and what not to do. And then as you begin making decisions, prayerfully, you look down the road to see what are the consequences of today's decisions five years from now. And the leader in any society is the person who sees farthest down the road the consequence, consequences of his decisions. That's the, that's the leader in any society. And therefore, we have an obligation to plan. Then the fourth word is the word personality. Verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. You know, it just, it's very difficult to understand this, but... Uh, there are some people who just believe that God called them to persecute everybody else. And verbally, that's all they ever do. I mean, maliciously attack and gossip and slander and libel. Their whole of life is a one continuous hate campaign. And nobody can get along with them. No matter how you try, they're just determined, uh, I'm not going to like you. I have a friend. Uh, I couldn't get, get him to a meeting uh, with some people. We were trying to heal a little situation. He says, no, if I go to that meeting, I'm afraid I'll like them and I don't want to. <laughs> well, there are just a lot of people who have that idea. You know, we, they're just, if we could just all sit down and talk and pray, the chances are 90% of our problems, we can work them out. Personality. And then in building personal relationships, not only is personality important, uh, but uh, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. I have the word here parenting, personal relationships. How can you be a successful preacher if you're not a successful daddy? How can you be a successful businessman if you're not a successful daddy? Come on now, I know I'm getting right down where you live. How can you be a successful uh, career woman if you're not a successful mother? Because that is first and that's foremost, and, and so proper parenting. And here, we, I have the word train up a child in the way you should go, proper parenting. By the way, look at verse 15. Dr. Spock didn't know this was in here. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The word um, here, foolishness, is the word rebellion. That's a better translation. Rebellion is bound in the heart of a little boy, a little girl, from the time he or she is born. And how do you get that rebellion out? Well, Solomon said, the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, I know that is not popular in today's world. And I suppose all of us abhor child abuse, and there's nothing lower on this earth than an adult who will misuse and abuse a child. But there's one way of abusing your child, and that is by failing to correct him or her and teaching character and principles to those sons and daughters. And another verse in the Proverbs says, that if you don't correct your son, if you do not at times put the paddle on the north end going south, that you hate your son, that you actually really don't love him. If you love your children, you correct them. Well, that's uh, developing personal relationships. Now, your business relationships. Building credibility in your business relationships. Look at verse 7. Here are some of those principles. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Let's use that same list here. Priorities, philosophy, planning, personality, parenting. First of all, priorities. Money cannot be your priority. If you're in business just to make money, the chances are you're going to fail. There are lots of verses that say, that tell us that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. And if you're motivated only by making money, the chances are you're going to fail. But if you want to be successful in business, and every businessman and woman ought to want to be successful, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a pastor who's satisfied with the size of his church. There's nothing wrong with pastoring a small church unless you're satisfied with it. When you get satisfied with that uh, status quo, which is Latin for the mess we're in, 
then you become, you become something less than aggressive and progressive and successful. Despise not the day of small things. Everything begins small. But I can tell you, I remember we had the 35 charter members just up the hill a couple hundred yards. I loved every one of them sitting in this building now, those who are still living. But I want you to know that they are part of 19 or 20,000 people now. And I'm not satisfied with this. And I hope none of my members are. I hope none of you are satisfied with what's going on now. Thank God for the 5,000 kids in the schools. Wonderful. 50,000 is our goal. When we get there, we'll wonder why we set such a terribly low goal. Television, radio, ministry, reaching people. All of life should be, get your priorities straight. Not to make money, but that God might put things into your hand to be a blessing to others. Now, if you're a Christian businessman, your call of God to that, just as I'm called to this pulpit, and your ministry, you want it to be successful so that you can reach out and bless and touch others. Philosophy, priorities, planning. Let me give you some quick verses here. I don't have time to go into all of it. I want you, when you get home, to take those... Uh, Oh, I don't know, five words that I used, priorities, philosophy, planning, personality, and parenting, and apply it to all three categories, all three divisions of the message. But in business relationships, I'll just brush by some verses for lack of time. Look at verse 9. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Here's a part of the philosophy of business relationships. Share what you have. Give to others. And reach out to the poor. Don't let anybody pass by you in need with you giving them a God bless you if it's in the power of your hand to help them. And God will honor you for that. Then we look at verse uh, 13. The slothful, that's the lazy man, say, if there's a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. The lazy man won't go out to go to work because he's afraid a lion will catch him and eat him alive. That was uh, several thousand years ago. <clears throat> Today he'd be afraid of being run over by a hot rod or something. All kinds of excuses for not going to work. You know, I, I believe we do have an unemployment problem in America, but it's not as serious as you read about. Because here, we, uh, we advertise for help. We have 1,300 employees. We advertise for help. It takes us a long time to get people to apply to work. And the same thing is happening all over the country. Uh, I look at verse 16. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich or bribes the rich shall surely come to want. Ill-gotten gain brings very little. And there's so much more. I don't have time to uh, notice, uh, for example, verse 26. Be not thou one of them that strikes hands, that is, it gives pledges, or of them that are sureties for debts. If you have nothing to pay, why should it take your bet away? In other words, if you're going to be successful in business relationships, don't sign notes. That uh, gets you out of a lot of trouble. This old Bible will get you out of a lot of trouble. Don't endorse notes. Unless, number one, you can afford to pay it off and it won't affect your family in any way. Number two, uh, you're willing to make it a gift to the person and never be angry at him. A and number three, your ongoing relationship with that person will be just as healthy as when you signed it and had to pay it off. Now, if you can do all of that, fine. Go ahead. But if you can't, don't sign it. That's what the Scripture says. And finally, uh, verse... Uh, 14, the mouth of, a stra of strange women is a deep pit, building credibility through your moral relationships. It isn't easy today to take a stand for what is right and moral and proper. But God's standard of morality hasn't changed in 6,000 years. One man for one woman for one lifetime. That's been God's plan for 6,000 years. You say, what about divorce? He's a God of forgiveness, a God of the second chance. Thank God for the story of the woman at the well who'd been married five times, was living then with a man to whom she wasn't married. The Lord forgave her and used her for his glory. But I'm saying the ideal is one man for one woman for a lifetime. And I'm saying to you that extramarital sex and premarital sex and homosexuality and promiscuous heterosexuality are just as wrong today as they were in the days that these words were written in this book. We don't have to change it. If you want to build credibility, you and your wife spend about 60 years together raising your children and grandchildren and teaching them how to live, not just how to make a living, and setting the example before them. Uh, I think that we, if we look at the teachings of the Word of God, we can build credibility. Let us pray.
while our heads are bowed. How many here will say, Pastor, I have a spiritual need. Maybe you're not a Christian. You'd like to become a Christian. You believe that Christ died for you, was buried for you, rose from the dead for you. You'd like, you'd like to know him as your Savior. Maybe as a child of God, you've gotten away from the Lord. You need help, whatever. We'd like to help you. While our heads about, how many here will say, Pastor, pray for me. I have a need for prayer today, and God knows what it is. Just slip your hand up, please, all over the building. Just slip your hand up. God bless every one of you. And there in the seat, there by the television, God loves you. Christ died for you. Just bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I trust you as my personal Savior, and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. In a few moments, we'll invite you to walk down the aisles here, and we'll meet you. Our pastors will go with you to a prayer room, give you literature. At home, I'll give you that, that same literature to you if you'll just uh, write me and tell me you've made the decision to trust Christ today. My booklet, How to Get Started Right, will be sent you. Give me your phone number if you need some counseling. We'll call you at our expense, J.O. Grooms, our soul winning pastors. If you have a prayer request, uh, write me about it. We'll answer you personally. We'll, write, we'll uh, pray for you by name, by need. If you need counseling, we have a prayer hotline available 24 hours a day. If you're deaf, we have a free TTY number here with somebody to counsel with the deaf. Let us help you. Shall we stand to pray? Father in heaven, each of us is a creature of need. And I pray that the Spirit of the living God will hover about each one and through Jesus Christ minister to every heart, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name I make this prayer. Amen. And while our heads are still bowed, our pastors are here at the front to meet you. From the balconies and from the main floor, I would like to ask every one of you with a need of any kind, you want to rebuild your life? Your life is all fouled up. You need Christ as your Savior. Or as a Christian, you've gotten away from God and you need to rebuild your credibility in your personal relationships, your business life, your moral relationships, whatever. We have pastors to help you. If you need family counseling, husband and wife, come together. If you want to join our church today, we invite you to come into our fellowship. While we sing, will you come? Thank you for watching this Old Time Gospel Hour program. If you would like to help train young champions for Christ, then call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 or write to Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514 and join the 15,000 Club. In Canada, write to Jerry Falwell, Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario, to show you our appreciation we'll send you this Christian Family Library, which will become indispensable in your daily Christian walk. Included stand, in the Christian Family Library on, is this sing. super giant print Bible with 24-point characters. The children's Bible story book has over 300 color illustrations. Finally, the Liberty Bible Commentary is a commentary on the Old and New Testament. Once again, that toll-free number is 1-800-446-5000. Now, this is John Corrigan inviting you to watch the Old Time Gospel Hour each week on this station. Until then, may God richly bless you is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.